He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave him, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Every year I come up with a theme for the year that we want to focus on. And you know that I will be preaching now in the next month, couple months in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. And again, that chapters, those chapters are about spiritual gifts. And all of us know a lot about individual spiritual gifts. God has given and blessed us with different gifts. But I want you to understand that it's not just about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are given individually to the body. It's about body life. And so I want us to think about life together in the body of Christ. And we don't do that well on the body of Christ. And so I'll be talking about that here for the next couple of months. And of course, that's our theme for the, the entire year next year, body life. And I want you to understand how important it is for the body and how it functions and how individual members are so important in this body with the gifts that God has given them to help this body to function. You know, we need to learn from Christ. We need to be disciples. The word disciple means a learner. It's one thing to be hearing God's Word. It's another thing to learn it. And this year, I want us not only to hear God's Word, I want us to learn it. When we talk about Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10 through 12, the context, of course, is that Jesus Christ came to this earth. He died on the cross. He went to the lower parts of the earth. Then He ascended and He led captivity captive. And when He did that, when He brought captivity captive, it says He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Obviously, it's not all people have these gifts. But these gifts are given individually to people for the whole sake of the body. The body functions by means of these gifts. God saw that the body needed these gifts within the body to help this body to grow. When it looks at 4, of course, in the King James Version, this is the New King James here, but 4, 4, 4, I want you to know that those are three or two different Greek words there. The Greek word is pros, ice, ice. And so even though it's translated 4, 4, 4, it actually should be translated based upon the Greek for and into and into. In other words, it should say that he's given some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teach for the equipping of the saints into the work of the ministry or unto the work of the ministry, unto the edifying of the body of Christ. The pastor's main task is not to do the work of ministry. The main task of pastors is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. Obviously, we all do work of ministry. But we have, over the years, said that the pastors were ministers. Are you in the ministry? Well, that's really wrong, because all of us are in the ministry. All of us are ministers. The task of a pastor or an evangelist is to perfect the saints or to mature the saints so that they, in turn, can do the work of ministry unto the edifying of the body of Christ. And once again, it's not the pastor's job to build up the church. Of course, Christ is the one who builds the church, but it is the job of all of the church body to minister so that the church would be edified and built up. Now, having said that, there are people who sit in the pew and say, I can't do that. I'm not gifted. I've never been trained to do ministry. The pastor, now he's been to Bible college. They have degrees and they are taught on how to do ministry, but I've never been taught that. And so what we do is we take some of our best people and we send them off to Bible college so that they will learn to be ministers. And they go off to Bible college and they learn this trade of being a minister and then they go and they, they journey to Toledo. <laughs> or they, they, they journey to... Ohio somewhere or Illinois somewhere and they become ministers or they become missionaries overseas and they do the work of ministry. I'm telling you what, there are people in Rochester that need to be saved. There are people in this area that need ministry. There are young children that need to come to Christ. There are teenagers, there are college age, there are middle age people and there are seniors in Rochester right here that need people to minister to them. What's wrong with a church that wants to build up people from within the church, 
raise them up, train them, equip them to do the work of the ministry. That's what God has asked us to do. That's what we need to be doing. Now, once again, the problem again is Bible college is not something that you find in the, in the Bible. Nothing wrong with Bible college. But it is the local church's responsibility to train and raise people up for the work of the ministry. We need to have some of our best people here trained in how to do this work right here in Rochester. We're not trying to show people how great of a church we have. We're not trying to show them how great our music program is. We're not trying to show them how great our preaching is or how great our pastor is. That's not our, our duty. That's not our desire. Our desire is to show people how great our Savior is. We've got an incredible Savior. Now, you look up here and you see here a, a, a bowl of olive oil. Now, you say, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Now, let me explain olive oil. Just, just for the sake of, of argument, let's say that everybody in Rochester burns lights with olive oil. All of our lights and all of our homes are run by olive oil. And I just want you to consider that there is no olive oil left in Walmart, and there's no olive oil left in Hy-Vee or in Fleet Farm. There's no olive oil in the entire town. A big problem. But in our church, we've got a 10,000-gallon drum of olive oil. We've got just this huge amount of olive oil. Would it make sense to you to have the people in Rochester who need olive oil to come to this church to find olive oil. Does that make sense? If we have olive oil to give and people in Rochester need olive oil, it just makes sense that this is the place that they would come to get olive oil, right? Well, the, the text that we're looking at this morning that I want you to look at right now is Colossians chapter 1 in verse 28. This is what it says. Whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. I want you to notice that God's desire is not to have a select few made perfect. His desire is to have all of the people in this church become mature and become perfect in Christ Jesus. That's his desire. In fact, the Apostle Paul was so burdened for this, he says in verse 29, Whereunto I also labor, that's why I labor, that's why I strive according to His working, which works in me mightily. This is why I do the things that I do. This is why I work, so that I can present people perfect in Christ. But I want you to look back at the, at the context here, verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I want to ask you a question now, Look, based upon olive oil here. How many of you would say that there are many people in Rochester, Minnesota that are lacking or not having hope, do not have hope, and they want hope? How many of you would say there are people in Rochester that don't have hope? Five of you, that's good. <laughs> now, I think basically everyone would raise their hand on that. How many of you would say that you have hope? How many of you say, say you have hope? Okay, that's five of you, which means about all of you. Now, what, what, what I'm saying is, here you have this situation where the people in Rochester need hope. Would you agree? The people in Rochester desperately need hope, and here in this church, we have a 10,000-gallon vat of hope. It wouldn't make sense to you that the people in Rochester would come here to find hope. That hope is not in our preaching. That hope is not in our music. It's in Christ in you, the hope of glory. And because Christ is within us and we have this hope, we have a hope of glory that God has placed within us. We have what God wants us to give to the people in Rochester. He's already given, given it to us. We already have the ability to minister. And so God is asking us to be able to get people ready to be able to minister that, that hope to people on this earth. Now, there are three things in Colossians 1.28. Again, that's our text this morning that I want you to consider. The three things are preaching, warning, and teaching. The idea then is by preaching, by warning, by teaching that we may be able to present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you'd help us as we just spend the time this morning looking at this passage. 
that you'd help us to see that we have something to give, that we have hope and the world needs that hope, that we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. I pray, Father, that you'd help us as a church to be able to present people, everyone in this church, mature through preaching and warning and teaching so that we would be able to share and give people what they need, that we would be able to help them find that hope that we found. In your name we pray, amen. Let's start with the word preach then. We'll start with this first part of it. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Word catangalo, catangalo, I get this right here, catangalo, that you can see the word angel in that. Angel is part of that. Well, an angel in the Bible is a messenger. There are many messengers that God sent out, and when Mary was going to have a child, God sent the angel Gabriel to Mary, and he gave her that message. And then he sent Gabriel, the angel, to Joseph to talk to Joseph as well. They are messengers sent. Angel means messenger. When you put the EU in front of it, that is the word for good. You have the word good like in eulogy, a good word. You're saying a eulogy for someone. That little word you means good, so good message. When you see the word euangelion or euangelos, it means a good message. Now we use that word, that is the word for gospel. The word euangelion means the gospel. Euangelo means to preach the gospel. We get our word evangelist from it. You just change the U to a V and you've got the word evangelism or evangel. So what you have in evangelist preaches the good news. Well, when we get to this word, you have that word angelos here, and it is a message as well, kata, meaning down or according to. The idea is to preach the message or place it down so that people can understand it. If you look it up in the Greek lexicon, it says to announce, to de declare, to promulgate, it's not spelled right, but promulgate and to make it known, making sure that the message is known, clearly known so people can understand the message. It is our ability or our desire as a pastor in order to present people perfect in Christ to make the message known. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or may be complete, thoroughly equipped to every good work. Now, having said that, look at what I'm saying. In the King James, that's the same word, to be perfect, that every man may be made, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped or thoroughly furnished to every good work. In order for us to preach so that people would be perfected or completed, we need to use the Word of God. God has given us this book so that we can correct, we can reprove, we can give instruction in righteousness. Now, having said that, every single person on this earth, from the time they are born, they grow up with wrong thoughts and wrong ideals. They grow up to take the way of the world into their mind. And when they grow up with the way of the world, they actually begin to think of a world view, and the world view becomes their view, and it's really contrary to the Word of God. And every single person on this earth without Jesus Christ is going to have thoughts in their minds that are going to be contrary to God's Word. Now, they're going to think their thoughts are correct, and they're going to think the Bible is wrong, but one of the purposes of the Word of God is to bring reproof to people's thinking and to bring correction to people's thinking. They can be instructed in righteousness so they can become mature or perfect. Again, every single person comes with that flaw in their thinking because they go the way of the world, which is controlled by Satan, the prince of the power of the air, which controls a lot of our thinking, which causes us to think contrary to God's Word. But we need to use the Bible in order to bring that reproof and that correction and that instruction so that people would become mature and complete in Christ. 
Now, one of the things I want to share with you is that the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Not all Scripture is doctrinal. Not all Scripture is reproof. Not all Scripture is correction. Not all Scripture is instruction. God does not want us to pick what is exciting or what we like to preach. He needs us to preach all Scripture so that we in turn can bring people to perfection by using reproof, correction, instruction so that the man of God might be perfect. Now I want you to understand in context, kid, you don't want to use, let the chapters divide or stop your thinking. The chapter divisions are not placed there by God, they're placed there by man. So when you have chapter 4 coming, he says, I therefore, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead as appearing in his kingdom. Uh, please, that's based upon what he just said in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3. The thought keeps going, and he says, I want you to understand, based upon what I've said, therefore, upon what I've just said, I want you to preach the word. Verse 2, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Please understand that that Bible has been given to us as a church has been given to us so that we can bring about perfection, maturity in the life of people. Now here's our problem. And again, it's one of the greatest problems we have here is people do not come to church to learn. They come to listen, but they don't come to learn. No one would take a college class the way you come to church. Because if you took college classes the way you came to church, you would not learn. If you went to med school and you came into med school and you sat down and sometimes you didn't bring your textbook, sometimes you did. And sometimes you slept, sometimes you thought, sometimes you thought about the dinner that you had cooking. And then you went out to operate on someone, it would be a big problem. Obviously you can't go to church and learn just by listening. There's got to be work and effort that place into the person that comes to church. I said in the very beginning, it's one thing to be a Christian, that's free, but God wants us to be a disciple, which means a learner. And so we come to church not only to hear God's Word, but to learn God's Word. And again, the problem is you have lots of people who come every week to church that don't know the Bible. They don't know how to use it for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that a man of God might be perfect. And yet it's our responsibility as Christians to try to teach God's Word to people so they can become perfected and matured. But it's not our work to do the work of the ministry. We are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, right? And so when we come to church... We need to come in a preparation and an expectation to learn what God's Word says. We should come with a pen or a pencil. And we should come making notations and making notes in your Bible, underlining key verses and underlining cross-references and making notations on how you can teach what you're learning. Because if you just come to learn, it's not going to benefit someone who needs what you are listening to today. If you just come to listen, it's not going to help people learn. We've got to change our thinking when we come to body life. What does body life mean? Well, body life is all based upon our church revolving around God's Word and His revelation. You hear me say it all the time. There are two eternal things in this world. There's only two eternal things on this earth. The chairs aren't going to be eternal. The railing, the pulpit, the carpeting, none of that's eternal. It's not even lasting 20 years, by the way. It's not very eternal. There's only two eternal things on this earth. The Word of God and people. And if you want a simple purpose in your life, it's to get the Word of God and people together. We've got to get the Word of God into people. That's our purpose. There are only two eternal things in the world. Let's get them together. Because people are going to be eternal and the Word of God is going to be eternal and they need, it. they need each other, right? And so our job is to preach the Word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. The Bible says, for the time has come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And that's the time that we're living in today. 
The importance of all Scripture, not just what we enjoy, but, but every part of it, complete the, the Scripture. Again, Romans 1.16, it's a great starting point, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation. And that's the first point. We need to share the gospel so people can be saved. But that's not the end. That's not what this church is about. That's somewhat of what we are about. We want to share the gospel. But our goal is to present every man, every man perfect in Christ. Our goal is to get people from the gospel to the other scriptures so that they can be reproved, rebuked, exhorted with, exhorted with all long suffering and doctrine. One of the things I think is important, if you'd have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. This is a difficult one to, to read in context. You'll have to read the context. It's very confusing in context. If I were to say at verse 10, For even that which was made glorious, and no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth, for if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is the glorious, it sounds really difficult to comprehend. And then he says all of that, con that sounds so difficult, then he says this in verse 12, Seeing then we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Well, that last few verses didn't seem very plain, but what he's talking about is Moses, when he got the Ten Commandments, there was a tremendous glory in the Ten Commandments. When he got them, his face shone because he was with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights on the mount. And he put a covering over his face so people wouldn't have to look at that glory, which glory was going to be done away. But he says, if we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Now again, I ask you the same question. How many of you have hope? Okay, five people. Okay. Obviously, if we all have hope, if we all have hope, what's the point? The point is we need to use a credible plainness of speech. We've got to make it understood. If you look it up in the lexicon, frank freedom in speaking, obviously some translations use this word boldness. I'm not sure boldness is the best, the best word on there. It says freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech, open frankly, without concealment. The Greek word. He wants us to have this clear so people can understand it. We have such hope, we use great plainness of speech so that people can understand. We make it clear for people to see. Colossians 1.28, the second point. We warn, the Greek word natheteo, natheteo meaning to place it to the mind. Him we preach, warning every man. Some of you will have the word admonishing every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that every man, we may present every man perfect in Christ. First of all, let me say, if you look at that verse again, we warn every man, we teach every man, we present every man perfect in Christ. Stop again. Think about it. God is not interested in our church picking out five to send to Bible college. God wants us to mature and perfect all of the people in this church. He wants every single person in this church to be mature in Christ. He wants every single person in this church to be able to use this book, to be a, a master of this book, to be able to find the hope in this book that we can share with other people. He wants every man perfected. And it's the job of this church to perfect every person. The word admonish, if you were to look it up in the Greek or in the, in the dictionary, it would see, just simply say to warn or reprimand someone firmly. And I want you to consider what that means. To reprimand, to warn someone, to reprimand someone firmly. When we talk about body life, there are times when we need to be corrected. Pastors need to be corrected. Deacons need to be corrected. Everyone needs to be corrected at times. The Word of God's job is to reprove, to correct instruction and in righteousness. There are times when we need to reprove one another. We need to warn them. We need to netheto, we need to place it to the mind. We need to, to admonish one another. Now, just... just for your sake, 
That's not the same thing as writing an anonymous note and sticking it under the pastor's door. Not the same. Saying, Pastor, I'm very disappointed in you what you did. And not sign it. That's not what the Bible teaches, okay? We have kind of made it a principle now that we're not going to read any anonymous notes. If they're anonymous, if there's no name, we throw them away. Because it's not biblical. Biblically, again, even, even the Romans, it said this in the Romans, it said, to deliver any man to die before he which is accused have his accusers face to face, okay? So that you can answer himself concerning the crime laid against him, you know? The hit and run tactic of putting an anonymous note and then not sharing so they can defend themselves is, is wrong. The Bible says it clearly. This is God's way. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. When that happens, iron sharpens iron. And you come and say, Pastor, I'm disappointed in something you did. It, first of all, he may very wrong, be very wrong on that, and he has a chance to ask you questions and find out why you're saying that. Or he may have an opportunity to explain why he did what he did. And you may be able to say, well, I didn't understand. But it's wrong to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Do you believe that? Our country doesn't allow that, to be the judge, jury, and executioner. And so... When you have a problem, you go to that person, you talk to them. That's body life. That's how bodies work. And we together learn from each other, and we grow from each other, and we take correction, and we reprove and exhort and encourage one another. It's very important that we learn that. That's how the body is perfected. But having said that, having, having said what I, just, what I just said, you understand there are times when we're wrong, we take worldviews not even knowing that they're worldviews. We talk to our friends and our friends have worldviews. I don't care if they go to Bible college. I don't care if they go to church. They may have wrong thoughts and they may be asking us to do something wrong. And you have to go to God's Word and say, is this right? There's times we need to be reproved. God's Word needs to correct us. The third point, the last point, is we teach. And I want you to understand in, this, in the context, in all wisdom, that's critical. So much of what we do is in man's wisdom. We need to do this in God's wisdom. We need to instruct in God's wisdom. This is the beginning of the book of Colossians. One of the things that Paul says, for this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, to ask you that you may be filled with all knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We need to have God's wisdom when we make decisions. And so we need to be praying for one another. Last Sunday morning in Sunday school, I, I talked to you all about the fact that we're priests, that God has made us priests, and because of that, we have the responsibility of being intercessors to be able to pray for unsaved people, to bring their needs before Christ, to be able to bring them before Christ and ask that God would be able to, to convict them of their need and help them to come to know Christ as Savior. Obviously, it's our desire to be able to pray for people that they would understand the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that they can't save themselves. There's nothing good that they can do in God's sight to please a holy God. They must be holy to enter into heaven. The only way they're going to have holiness is through what Jesus Christ did on the cross when He died on the cross for their sins. Give them eternal life by putting their trust in Him. But having said that, let me close this by saying this. We started this, let me, start, let me close this. We are interested in discipleship. It's one thing for us to be able to proclaim God's Word in a way that's simple and clear and people can understand it. But it's another thing for people in the pew to be learners and to take God's Word and bring it into their heart and apply it to their heart and learn. So they not only have it, but they have it to give to someone who needs it. That we don't just come to church to listen. We come to church to learn. And in our church, when we come to this coming year of 2019, if we're going to come before God someday and, and God's going to say, Pastor Lapine, I instructed you to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. How did you do? Did you present the people in your church perfect in Christ I am, will be held accountable for that. But God wants the people in the church to become learners. 
to understand correction, instru- understand instruction and in righteousness, understand what God's purpose is for your life. So we need to not only hear, we need to obey. We need to write it down. We need to take notes. We need to study God's Word so we become experts at this book so we can help other people. They need, they, they need hope. We have hope. We have a 10,000-gallon drum of hope. We just need to pass it Thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.